I want to welcome you to the 1130 Wednesday Bible study. We call it our lunch and Bible study. We used to have it at the church, and now we're having it in your home. But at 1130, and uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the last time we met, uh, I, I missed a week, but the, the last time we met, we studied how deceitful lying called falsehood uh, grieves the indwelling Holy Spirit in the Christian life. We're in a series, I, I, was, I did quenching, a series on quenching the Holy Spirit, and then had requests to do a study on the grieving uh, of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm in the midst of that. I believe this is my third lesson on grieving the Holy Spirit. And uh, last time we looked at one of the ways you do is deceitful lying in the Christian life. That's in verse 25. Uh, we learned three things that I'd like to review with you. We learned that the spiritual problem-solving device for deceitful lying called falsehood was twofold. Sometimes people miss that in this passage. One said one of the, the problem-solving devices was to lay aside, lay aside deceitful lying and in its place, speak the second part. And in its place, speak the truth of God's word. Speak the truth of God's word. The other thing we learned, we learned that the source behind deceitful lying was the devil's cosmos diabolicus thinking. In other words, worldly thinking, uh, void of the influence of God the word God and the word of God in it. Worldly thinking, they call it cosmos, worldly, diabolicus, the devil. And so theologically, we call it cosmos diabolicus. We do that so we can feel like uh, we're worthy of the money you give us to, to, to teach you. But it's called cosmos diabolicus. And for whatever reason, it's worldly thinking devoid of divine influence on the, that thinking. And we call it when, it, when it becomes part of the way your pattern of thinking in life, we call it old man, cosmos diabolicus thinking. So these are terms I'd like to have you become familiar with. And uh, cosmos diabolicus stands in direct opposition uh, to the word and will of God. Now, you can see it very clearly. This will not be hard for you to see the source behind it when you read Genesis 2 and 3. In Genesis 2, 17, God says to the couple, Adam and Eve, uh, from the tree, all the trees you can eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat. The day you eat, die, and you will die. Well, in the third chapter, they eat and die, and they die. And who led that revolt against the word of God? Who influenced them to think a different way in opposition to the truth of the word of God was the devil. He was called the serpent, but in Revelation 22, the serpent is described, the dragon, the serpent, Satan, the devil, yada, yada, the evil one. So Paul, in reminding us about this in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, we, as Christians, we must not be ignorant of the schemes or the devices or the strategy the devil has against the Christian and the word of God. So that's very important. You know that. The third thing that we learned from that lesson the last time we met, that in the passage that we've been talking about, verses, well, actually, it goes up to verse 20 and goes through a larger passage. But within those verses, 25 through, I don't know, 29, there are 11 Greek, 11 Greek imperatives. Now, that's a whole lot of imperatives from verse 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. In that section, there are 11 commands. I mean, when you can find a, a, a short passage of Scripture that has 11 imperatives, that's heavily loaded. Imperative is a command. And so 
Uh, today's lesson, just for example, I'm going to be in verses 26 and 27. There are four of these 11 commands given in two verses. Four in two verses. So I want you to pay attention to that today. Uh, today we're going to study four aspects of another way you grieve the Holy Spirit. Listen to me now. Giving the devil opportunities into the Christian life to influence the way you think and live. It's in our passage. One of the ways you can grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit is giving the devil opportunities in the Christian life of the way influencing the way you think cosmos diabolicus and live. So we're going to talk about that. Don't give the devil, don't give the devil an opportunity, a foothold, uh, a place of operation to distort the way you think and live uh, in contrast to the word of God. He can do that in the life of a believer. He can't indwell, but he can influence, not indwell, influence, not indwell, influence. You're going to learn that today. Listen, we know it from Adam and Eve. If you didn't, you go, well, where are you show me in the Bible? Third chapter of Genesis is clear as a second. And then you compare it, what Peter, uh, what Paul taught in first in second Corinthians 11, three, Adam and Eve, 11, three, and first Timothy two fourteen. You know, you know I, I don't mind you saying where in the Bible do you find it. I like that. I, that's, the, that's the way we all should think. When I give it to you, you should research it. See whether or not it's true or not. I mean, if you do it to me, do you do it to others? Why would you take some other person's view and not compare it to the Word of God when I give it to you and I give you the Scriptures for you to compare it to? I load my lessons up with Scriptures that I believe are pertinent to the, to the questions. I'm just saying, you know, fair is fair. Give me a fair hearing. Fair is fair. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in the Christian's life. It could be mental attitude type sin, sense of the tongue, or vert. What's my solution? What's my problem-solving device spiritually? Well, Confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9. I like it because of one word in there. I like it because all the words, but one word, it clicks in my soul. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us. Watch this word, cleanse. Goes back to verse 7, takes us to the cross. At the cross, for the unbeliever, he believes it so he can be saved. The blood of Christ saves him from Adamic sin. But for the believer... He confesses his sin to be restored to spirituality, the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's why it's important. And that's important because the Holy Spirit, one of his missions, John 14, 26, is teach and recall, teach and recall, teach and recall. Now, you know, have you got a pencil and paper and a, and a Bible and are you taking it down or do you go on the web and pull down our notes? If not, you should. I mean, it's Bible study. Good grief, people. Come on. So get your Bible. I'll give you an opportunity. Go get your Bible. Get your paper, piece of paper and a pencil like you're supposed to do when you come to class. And let's study. Let's study for growth and development of our Christian life to have an influence for God in the world. We are the light of the world. You don't hide the light. You put it up. Uh, you don't put it under the stand. You put it on top of the stand. You know, nobody's, nobody puts the kitchen light under the table. They put it up in the ceiling. That's all I'm asking you to do today. That's all I'm asking you to do. Uh, let's put the light, the word of God, the oil of the lamp. Come on. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get in our morning study. Uh, don't give the devil... Don't give the devil uh, a, an opportunity in your life to influence the way you think and live in, con in contrast to the Word of God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way uh, by the Internet. I'm thankful for every person, Father, that will open their hearts to the truth of the Word of God and let it influence the way they think and live. I mean, that's the name of the game for me. 
uh, for the Christian life. We walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Couldn't be more simple than that. And so I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would influence us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God by giving the devil an opportunity, opportunity or a foothold or a place of operation of influence. While he cannot indwell, he can influence. And we're going to talk about that today. Father, Give encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one. Point number one. We're going to look at four things today. Point number one. Oh, by the way, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells you to walk by faith. I just said that in my prayer. Walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, walk by faith, not by sight. Now, the devil influences you to sight. If you go back to Genesis 3rd chapter 1 through 6, you will see the woman saw. And what she saw was in opposition to what the word of God said, but it lined up with what the devil said. Uh, that's giving the devil a foothold. That's giving him a place of influence. That's what I'm talking about. In today's lesson, Paul used four Greek imperatives in verse 26 and 27. 26, here it is, 26 and 27, four imperatives. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. In those two verses, there are four Greek imperative commands given to the Christian. These, this is to believers. All right? These four imperatives are issued as warnings against giving the devil an opportunity of influence. I'm going to read it again because you missed it. Be angry. That's a positive. And then the three negatives. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. I'm going to explain it in the Greek language. It will require, for, the, for example, the word opportunity is topos. A place, a foothold, a room. Don't give him room. So we're going to talk about that. Notice again, when you go back to the text, look at it. See the word be angry? That's a positive. That's righteous indignation. Be angry in a positive way. That your anger lines up with the influence of God in your life and the word of God. And then he gives you three negatives. But notice the three negatives. Yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. One positive and three negatives. One positive and three negatives. In the Greek language, you can see the negatives. For example, the word not is the word may. The first time it's used, the word not, it's may, M-E. The second time it's used, uh, the first time do not sin. The second time, do not let the sun go down. The third time, it has mede. It's the M-E plus the D-E because of but, translated in English and, but don't. That's how that should be translated. Don't give the devil an opportunity. So you always have the word may, when, he, when you have the negative may in the Greek language with the present tense, which it is in um, do not sin, present imperative. Do not let the sun go down, present imperative. Do not give the devil an opportunity, present imperative. When you have the negative may in the Greek language with a present imperative, it means stop and don't do it again. Stop it 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 and don't do it again. That's what it means. That's the power of the present imperative. Stop and don't do it again. Don't do that. And you know why? Because it grieves the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It grieves it. 
Grieving is like the loss of something of value, a death, car wreck, whatever. Tornado comes through and destroys everything, whatever. Be angry is the Greek word orgazo. orgazo. It's a present passive imperative. A present passive imperative. All of them are second person plural, y'all. Orgazo is a word is a very strong word for anger. It's an anger that's been settled into an attitude. Whenever that comes up, it's already ready to flare out. It's part of a, a way you think and a lifestyle. It don't even have to it, it it's placed there, it's grounded, it's rooted in you, so that when something occurs, boom, there it is, in force. You don't get a little bit mad, you get angry. And it just comes out like boom. That's because it's been settled in. It's part of your, it's been rooted in you. Rooted in you like bitterness and anger and wrath. It's become part of who you are and the way you operate. And at some point, quote, they can push your button you don't even go through a process of being hurt and being, being mad and going to anger. No, you just come out with a full force of, a force of anger. You just spew anger out. That's our word. But it's a positive. It's a positive based on the rooting of the word of God and the righteousness of God so that when evil has an influence on your life, you become angry because of the evil that you're surrounded with, the, the, that surrounds you, the influence that surrounds you, not in you, it's around you. Let me give you an example. If you're a believer with a half a wit of growth, you're not just a new convert, you're somebody who's been a while in the word of God, do you not see the evil in our society today in America? Do you not see it? And I'm not, I'm not, it's not where the devil, the devil disguises evil with, with good. He, he plays Little Red Riding Hood, you know, with a wolf dressed up. Oh, you know, what big teeth you have. He disguises. He's the master disguiser of evil plotting against us. You do know that. Tell me you know that. Tell me that he, he can manifest himself like an angel of light, and yet he's darkness. It's a disguise. It's pretense. It's play acting. Can you see through it? Can you see evil for evil? Now, how do I know what's evil? The Bible tells you. Just like, what, how do I know what is sin? The Bible tells you. The Bible tells you what sin is. The Bible tells you what evil is. You don't make it up on your own, on your fly. Be angry. That's righteous indignation. And that's positive. It's based, it comes from the word of God. Listen, eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. No, don't eat of it. You don't have to eat of it to know the difference between good and evil. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. You don't eat to gain that. You don't eat it. You have to eat something else. What is that? The word of God. Every day, the, the father met with the couple and fed them the, in the cool of the day, fed them the word of God. That's how you know the difference between good and evil. The word of God tells you what's evil and tells you what good is. I'm afraid that we in the church today don't know the difference between good and evil and the devil's having a heyday with us. Because we don't pay enough attention. We don't study the Bible anymore. You teach an hour to people and they go like, oh, that is so long. 
Listen, you watch a movie for two hours. Look, at if it requires you to study an hour with popcorn, bring popcorn. You go to a movie and spend two hours. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with time. It has to do with interest. It is obvious that the devil today in America, I can only speak for America, it's the only place I know. It is obvious that the devil is making a big push today because he thinks he has the church on the ropes and is going for the knockout punch. And I'll tell you, he's got the church on the ropes. And the church better wake up. This whole virus thing is to have a spiritual awakening. I'm teaching this on Sunday in the life of Elijah. Now, I don't know who I'm teaching it to, but I'm teaching it to somebody. Somebody's got to listen to me. If you're in one of the 186 countries that are going through a virus, you should be listening to me. It is obvious the devil is making a big push with evil today because he thinks he has the church on the rope and is ready for a knockout punch. And listen, it's obvious in your face. Evil today is not disguised. It's blatant and in your face. And if you can't see it, it's because you are blind to the word of God and not to the ways of the world. It's blatant. It's in your face. What you going to do about it? What you going to do about it? And I don't see any big challenge to it. I don't see any big pushback. I don't see anybody understands what's going on in the church. This ought to be obvious. Just as much as the drought in the life of Elijah. Well, there's the positive. Righteous indignation. Even Jesus had that. God has it. And a believer has it when he sees the evil. In it. I have it with the evil influence. It's righteous indignation. Now we're told three negatives. He says, now do not sin. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't take it out of its periphery. It belongs. It belongs. Your anger belongs in the word of God directed towards evil, which stands in opposition, trying to put death to the church, trying to put death to the word of God, trying to destroy it. The devil, listen, he tried to destroy Jesus first by coaxing him out of the influence of God and the word of God in his life in Matthew 4. And then he finally went behind his back and uh, tried to kill him. Then finally the father gave permission and uh, hung him on a cross. It was the worst day of the devil's life because on the cross Jesus defeated him once forever. Oh, yeah. He's a roaring lion without teeth, 1 Peter 5, 8. He's got, he's got none except what you give him. He has no influence over your life except what you give him volitionally. You should give him nothing. You should give him what God's going to give him. You know what God's going to give him? He's going to give him hell. You know what you should give him? You should give him hell. I don't know how clear I could say that. And when he says do not sin, he says stop it. And don't do it anymore. Then he says, do not let the sun go down upon your anger. And he changed the word. He added a preposition to the front of the word that he used anger in a positive way. He came back and used it, put, add power on the front of it, and it means get involved in a cluster of sin, mental attitude sins. Power or gizzo. This time it has a mass on the end instead of an O. It's a cluster. It's a snowball rolling down a hill. You know what it does? It just gathers more snow. And you got the first ball of a snowman. That's what he's talking about. And you know what he says? He says, stop that. 
and don't do it again. Don't do it anymore. And then the third one, do not give. He does the same thing. Do not give the devil an opportunity, present active imperative, of did oh my, don't give. It's volitional. It's a, it's, a, it's a present active. The active is the voice of volition. And it's command, don't do that with a negative may. In other words, you could, don't. And if you have, stop and don't do it anymore. Stop giving the devil a place of influence in the Christian life. Influence. Can't indwell. No, that the Holy Spirit has that. But he can influence. And the word opportunity is used in the English is the word topos. It means a foothold. It means a, a room, a place. Where do you think all this anarchy is coming from in the streets? Listen, we had this back in the 60s and we fought it. The church, the church woke up and began to fight it. I was one of the frontline fighters of it, going on to college campuses and, and uh, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anarchy. Did you not know that's evil? Huh? Burn down the streets. Burn down the buildings. Anarchy. What we got going in our nation right now is anarchy. And how you vote this year is going to be really important. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your sin. And by all means, do not let the devil have a place of opportunity. Point number two. Remember, one positive, three negatives. The three negatives say, stop. Stop. Be angry is a positive command directed to new man divine viewpoint thinking as a believer. New man divine viewpoint thinking. Ephesians 4.24 Part of our passage, Ephesians 4.24 in a greater context, and put on. See, we were told to put off, lay aside or put off. Now we're told to put on. Put on, heiress middle infinitive, the new man, the kainos anthropos, 1 Corinthians 15.22. Everybody's born in Adam. Everybody's born again in Christ. Everybody starts out their physical life in Adam, spiritually dead, alienated from God, blind, cursed, condemned, dead, darkness, enmity, the natural man perishing, unrighteous, ungodly, unholy, sinner under the wrath of God. You got to be born again. You got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, for your sins and my sins, was buried, and on the third day of his burial, raised from the dead to give you life everlasting in time and eternity. Then you become a new man. You become a new man in Christ. You become a new man in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a new creation in Christ. You're, you're born, you're regenerated, you're born again as a baby believer with, as, in the image of Christ. And you develop into immaturity and into maturity so that you become a mature man in Christ. My, my, my. I can't believe I have to keep teaching this over and over and over again. Someday, somebody's got to listen to me. 1 Peter 2, 2, we start out the Christian light as a breath as a baby. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14, we progress from that with our security of our salvation to an immature level, an, an adolescent in the image of Christ, a napios, and we move to Ephesians 4, 13, a mature man in Christ, that is the image of Christ in his total state. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is all about. 
And what is it all about is growing in the Word of God from milk to meat. You go from milk, pure milk, you go to milk and meat in immaturity, and you go to meat in maturity. Well, you should read Ephesians, the fifth, uh, 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 Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Yeah. Romans 6, 6 says, the old man has been crucified with Christ, and we've put on, and in that, a new man has been created. An old man has been crucified, that's in Adam, and a new man has been created in righteousness according to the image of God and Christ. Ephesians 4, listen to Ephesians 4.21. Put on the new man, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness, holiness of the truth. That is, the likeness of God in the soul, in the human body, just like Jesus. Jesus said, if, if, you, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. In the Christian life, if you've seen me, you've seen Christ, should be our motto. If you've seen me, you've seen Christ. But that's a person who has developed spiritual growth through the study of the Word of God and has been faithful through the testings and the exercise of that Word of God in his life through the faith cycle to become a mature man in Christ so that when others see you, they see Christ in you. I don't know, I'm just saying, you should know that. You say, where do you get that in the Bible? Romans 8, chapter, verse 29. Ephesians 4, 23. I mean, it's all over the Bible if you'd study it. Now, here's what's of interest to me as a pastor, teacher. When you look at Ephesians 2.20 through 24 is one Greek sentence. In the Greek Bible, verse 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 is one Greek sentence. That's one complete thought. That is a lot of information there. But it's one thought. It's one sentence. The second thing's of interest in this passage. See, that's, that's the prelude to my lesson. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. See, that's the prelude to, my, to, to where I've taken grieve the Holy Spirit. That's the prelude. That sentence leads the way. Now, here, here's the second thing. Interest about this one Greek sentence, verses 20 through 24. There are three infinitives. There are three aorist infinitives that work off the main verb were taught in verse 21. We're taught, the dasko is an aorist passive indicative, second person plural. The passive voice means they are being taught about the subject matter so that they, they can live that Christian life in the power and authority of the Word of God in a full, mature status of the mature man in Christ. I'm just telling you what's there. The first infinitive in this one verse, the first infinitive is... Put off, that's lay aside. Put off, it's an aorist middle infinitive in verse 22. The second infinitive, be renewed, present passive infinitive. That is the subject receiving, renewing. That's Romans 12.2. That's in verse 23. That's 423. And put on is an aorist infinitive. That's in verse 24. You have to be taught 
how to put on, be renewed, and to put off. You go to a church that can do that? You go to a church that can teach you that? You, do you go to a church that even knows what I'm talking about out of that passage? This one does. I guarantee you we know what this means, and we teach it. But this is the only way you can fight the scheming deviancy of the devil. It's the only way you can be angry and sin not. Not, not to let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Be angry and sin not is a righteous indignation of what the devil is allowed to do without the spiritual advancing believer drawing the sword of the spirit of Ephesians 6, 17. Put on the full armor of God. And what do I fight with? Do I fist fight? Do I get a paring knife? Do I take a hatchet? Do I take a hammer? Piece of dynamite? A 30 out six? Shotgun? Nah, none of that. That's not how you fight in the war against the devil. It's an invisible war. It's a spiritual war. It's called the angelic conflict. There's only one weapon that works against the devil. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word of truth. And one hour of study is too much for you? When I was drafted into the military, I spent eight weeks in basic training with a weapon. Twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week for eight weeks. Add that up. Add all those hours up. And they all belong to it. You whine because we ask you to study a little bit because we're in the war of our life. They say, we're so far beyond a cultural war. Let me tell you, church, we're fighting for the church. The enemy wants to make America a desolate place like it was when we came. At best, heathens, pagans, no word of God. Worshiping idolatry. Jeez. We're fighting for the existence of the church in America. You know what's made America great? The church. The church of Jesus Christ. And you know what will happen in America if we don't arise at this time and become spiritually awakened and take seriously the calling of God upon our life? He's going to remove the candlestick. He's going to remove the church and put it someplace else. And America will not, not be that great beacon of light to the world. Our prosperity is based on God. All he has to do is send a virus, and he can stop it in a heartbeat, can he? Just like he did a drought in the life of Elijah. My, my, what's wrong with us? I'll tell you what's wrong with us. We don't study the Word of God. We have no idea about a spiritual war of Ephesians 6, chapter 10 through 17. Put on the full armor of God. Nobody has no, Nobody's willing to go through eight weeks of basics to learn how to wear the full armor of God. Would you sign up for eight weeks, for 24 hours a day, for seven days, for eight weeks?
My goodness. You whine. We ask you to spend two or three hours a week in the Word of God, and you whine and cry, and you wonder why your life's a mess. My, my, my. We're in a spiritual war. The offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God of truth. The gospel that we preach is based on the omnipotent power of God, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. We're in a spiritual war. We always have been. The church is in a spiritual war. This spiritual war is in America, in the land I love. I don't love the land more than I love God, I can tell you that. I love the land because I love God who gave it to us. The spiritual war against an invisible but real enemy is described in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, worth your read. You ought to be reading the Bible instead of listening to 6 o'clock news. It's all goofy. You can get the accurate information from the Word of God what's going on in the streets of America. It is a war of God's absolute truth. And the devil's relativity lies. You ought to read John, the 8th chapter, especially verses 44 through 47, because I wouldn't want to burn you. It might take too long to read a whole chapter. I know I'm being sarcastic because we got to wake up. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't know. How free are you? Galatians 5 one says, it was for freedom that Christ set you free from the bondage of Adam's sin. What kind of bondage are you in today? My, my. It is the war of conforming to the world versus being transformed by the renewing your mind to God. Romans 12, chapter, verse 2. Point three. Now pay special attention to the three negative commands in verses 26 and 27 of our text, Ephesians 4. They are the results of not handling anger as a righteous indignation by letting God handle it his way. I'm going to say that again because it, it, by now I've taught so long, you're probably asleep or going off somewhere. So if you return to this, maybe you can pay attention. Pay special attention to the three negative commands given in Ephesians 4, 26, 27. That are the results of the believer not handling anger as righteous indignation by letting God handle it in his way. Let me, you remember the story of Job. Long book, I don't expect you to read that. My, it's too long, 42 chapters. That's war and peace, ain't it? <laughs> Jeez. Well, what a wonderful book that is because God marched three friends with the word of God in their hand who didn't have a clue what Job was going through and tried to tell them how to go through it, and they didn't have a clue what he was going through. And so God marched three guys in there with their Bibles to tell him what was wrong with his life and how he could correct it. And they didn't have a clue what was going on. That's the book of Job. They gave him three different views <laughs> on why he was going through it and why he was suffering with God. At the end of the book, God showed up and showed him he said, you listen to all the wrong teachers. So I'm going to tell you, not one time have you asked me to teach you what was going on. You've whined and cried and belly ached. You've listened to their influence and you spent time arguing their influences. And you haven't paid any attention to me and my word. So at the end of this, he said, now, let me explain to you what's going on with you. It's called undeserved suffering. 
suffering for Christ. In one chapter, God clears it up. He spent 40, 40 chapters, 41 chapters, with his soul in a mess and his mind out of control. When will you ever learn to study the Bible? When will you ever learn to study the Bible? It's the greatest book. Once you shut the television off a while, they're not going to tell you anything relevant to your life anyhow. They got no solutions. Why don't you take some time off and study the Bible the way you do? It's the most relaxing thing I do every day is study the Bible. It refreshes my soul and refuels me for the next day. If you are interested, we will be studying some additional reasons of how to deal with the evil we're facing today. Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down and do not give the devil an opportunity on Sunday in the life of Elijah. You should pick that study up, the life of Elijah. And when we get to chapter 18, which we're now in, God will give you examples of the principle. <laughs> Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold in the way you think or the choices you make in your life. Because it'll pay, it, it, you'll pay a price for it. Yep. These three negatives are the very things you will have to stop and put off, lay aside to prevent the, giving the devil an opportunity to disrupt, disrupt your walk of faith. Could you give me an example, Ron? I'm going to save you from asking me. Could you give me an example of be angry and, and uh, not sin? Mm -hmm. I give you an example where the church failed. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 11. And then 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, 6 through 11. If you want to have the answer, you're going to have to read it. Be angry, we do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Notice it has power on the front of the word anger. Don't build up a cluster of sins upon your anger. Listen, here's a person who's already angry. But when he says, be angry, it's based on the word of God. Righteous indignation for the evil influence. Outside of you, don't let it get inside of you. Don't let that get inside of you. Do not give the devil an opportunity, and the writer uses the idea of stop. The church was already in trouble with it like we are. In the bigger picture of content, you should read Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. Let me conclude. The spiritual problem solving device for not giving the devil an opportunity is given by James in James 4, 7. Here is Cliff Note version for some of you that were alive when Cliff Notes were in existence. James summarizes this idea in James 4, 7. Listen to this. Three things. Submit Therefore, to God, let God handle it. Let God have, handle it. The devil can handle the devil. You handle the word of God. You walk by faith. Let God handle the devil. Submit, therefore, to God. Two, resist the devil. 
That's what we're talking about. Resist the devil. How do you do it? You draw the sword of the Spirit, the word of truth, against him. Jesus did it in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Write this down. Peter didn't do it in Matthew 16, 21 through 23. And the devil got, a, got an influence in his life. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Nah, yeah, now you want to write it down. For Jesus, it was Matthew 4, 1 through 11, his confrontation. His second confrontation was with Peter, not the devil, but Peter. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and you know what? He will flee from you. <laughs> he don't flee from you. It is because you submitted to God, and God is supreme, and it is God that confronts him. Submit to God, and he will flee from you. Pull the sword of the word of God at him, and he'll flee from you. He did from Jesus. First John 4, 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he, the Holy Spirit, who is in you than he, the devil, who is in the world. 1 John 5, 19. Here is 1 Peter 5, 6. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be of a sober spirit. He's talking about the human spirit. Sober. All your faculties on fire for God through his word. Be of a sober spirit. Let your spirit be in tune with the indwelling spirit of God who is directing your thoughts and, 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 and actions in life based on the word of God. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. That's a sentry on duty carrying a weapon. Halt, who goes there? And it better be the right words. Be on the alert. Your adversary, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Watch this. Resist him. Firm in your faith. That's that faith cycle. Well, can I tell you what his prize is? Why, why does he go to such an effort against you and I? Here it is. What's his prize? Why would he do that? What's his prize? I'm going to slide back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11, the second, 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, verse 3, where I actually started with Adam and Eve. This is Paul. I am afraid, least as the serpent, Satan, in disguise, deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, that's the minefield he's after, your minds should be led astray. Now here's his prize. Watch what he's after in your life. From the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's what he's after. That's what he's after. That's his prize. To get your mind led astray from the prize of the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Yes. This is not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. It's simple biblical truth that needs to be applied to our lives more than ever during this time 
of the virus in America and across the world. Somebody has got to listen to me. Somebody has got to have ears to hear. Jesus said to the churches, the seven churches, read them in Revelation 2 and 3. If you have an ear, hear what the Spirit says to the church. If you have an ear, hear the Word of God and what the Spirit says to the church. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come and endured the time with us. One of the ways to grieve the indwelling Holy Spirit is to give room inside that life of influence that the Holy Spirit should have dominance over. We should be angry with this type of influence in our churches in America. The church must become awake and get on the front line of fight. This is a war we're in. It's not a cultural war. It's a spiritual war. My, my, my. Jesus, help us. Encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.